here for a live chat. Hi everyone, I'm Karen Brooks. Um, I'm just going to wait for a few people, a few more people to join us. Um, here in my home in Hobart, Tasmania, have the heater on behind me. It's a very chilly night. So I'm really grateful that any of you are spending a bit of time so I can talk tonight about my latest book, The Good Wife of, well, I have to get used to the camera, The Good Wife of Bath, and um, all things writing, life, the universe, all that sort of stuff. So, um, oh gosh, where do I begin? I've been told to talk a little bit about myself. Oh, hi, Mary Lou. Yay. My sister and my husband aren't the only people with me. That's great. <laughs> um, hi up there from the Sunshine Coast, on the Sunshine Coast. So yeah, I've been asked to talk a little bit about myself and um, I haven't always been an author, but ironically in a way, my um, all my careers have started with an A, which I think is really weird. Oh, hello, Becky. Hello, Tracy from Sydney. Oh, God, Sydney, you poor buggers. Uh, a lot of my family and friends are up there and my heart really goes out to you. And same with you, Victorians. You're keeping us all safe and South Australians and we're really, really grateful and we feel doubly grateful and a little bit guilty down here in Tassie that we, we have it so good. Hopefully it keeps that way too. And hello, Alison and Helen. Hi, Kerry. Oh, miss you, darling. Um, Jenny, my gorgeous sister. Hi, Sally. Jan from Melbourne. Hi, Better Reading team. Hi, Suzanne. Um, okay, what can I tell you about myself? So the career starting with A. Hi, Melissa. Oh, Suzanne from Perth. Is from Perth. Hi, hi over there in Perth. Um, I was an actor to start with and um, oh, I was a checkout chick before that. That doesn't start with A, does it? And um, then I became an army officer. I was an army officer for five years in the Australian Army. That was a really interesting and, and fabulous career move. And then I um, became an academic uh, and I stayed in academia. Well, arguably, I still am a little bit. I have a foot in that camp uh, for about oh, 25 years now um, and got to associate professor. And then um, basically, to cut a very long story short, I got diagnosed with cancer and that sort of turned my whole life upside down. And I was already writing a little bit. I was actually a columnist for a mainstream newspaper for about 18 years, as well as an academic, but um, I wrote creatively as well. And fortunately, when my illness didn't allow me to continue full time as an academic, I fell back on that and started off really in fantasy, YA fantasy, historical fantasy, and then segued into just, just, just historical fiction. So that's what I do now. And oh, hello, the guys from Happy Valley Book Street. Hi, Phil and Craig. Hi, Jill. Hi, Maureen. Oh, from Maroochydore, my old stamping ground. I was up there at the University of the Sunshine Coast for many years. Hi, Kylie. Um, hi, Melissa. I think I said hello to you. And hello, my darling Francis from Macedon, one of my bestest, oldest mates. Um, hi, Wendy from Wagga Wagga and Kylie, Denise, Vicky. Um, oh, Catherine, you're on holidays in the Northern Territory. Jesse, hi. Oh, this is lovely. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, Rebecca, my God. Rebecca's one of my old students. So not so old. Sorry, Rebecca. And Jesse, hi. Um, okay, so where do I begin telling you? Oh, hi, Kerry. Oh, my soul sister. And Shannon, too, if you're there, hello. Um, Jacqueline from Brisbane, hi. Oh, this is so much fun. Um, I, it's very easy to get off track, though, isn't it? And I have a glass of wine here, which I daren't have started yet, so, but I will throughout the course, so bear with me. All right, now, time to talk about my historical fiction. So, um, gosh, my first one was The Brewer's Tale, which I will actually get to um, later on in the talk. But then I wrote, I, I tend to um, write about women in history and I try to use trade as I guess the sort of uh, linking theme, if you like, between my books, I try to uncover the trades that women, even though we think they were dominated by men, but women were very much a part of. So The Brewer's Tale was about a medieval female brewer. Then I did a book about locksmithing and um, about a fabulous female lockpick during Elizabeth I's reign. And she became part of Sir Francis Walsingham's spy network and it's what she got up to and everything and all based whoops, on historical fact and, and um, quite authentic in that sense. And then I did The Chocolate Maker's Wife, which was all about the introduction of chocolate into England because it was a drink. And it was a drink that also uh, coincided with the start of journalism in, in the 1600s and how that changed the face of, of society and indeed the world. Um, and then I wrote The Darker Shore, which was based on the horrible true story of what was fundamentally the last witch hunt in Scotland and what happened to these group of women, fishwives, on the east coast of Scotland, yet yeah, the darkest shore. 
And then I wrote this, The Good Wife of Bath. Well, it's there in the corner, so I don't really have to keep holding it up. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, but first of all, I'll say some more highs. Oh, hi, my darling Margie. You're freezing me. You poor thing, are you? Hi, Kylie and Adelaide. I know the lockdown, you poor thing. And hi, Tracy. I will answer your question right now. How did I come up with the premise for The Good Wife of Bath? So I'll say some more hellos shortly, but I'll, I'll deal with that. Now, the premise of The Good Wife of Bath, well, it's based on The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. Now, don't panic if you haven't read them and if you hear that. And what, what that is about, well, basically, Geoffrey Chaucer is called the father of English literature. And he was the first person to actually write in plain English. Um, English people were starting to become more literate. They Their language was evolving. And he wrote uh, all sorts of things, poems and stories. But then he decided later in his life to tell the story of 31 pilgrims who were walking to Canterbury from Southwark on the outskirts. It was then the outskirts of London. And to pass the time, because it was quite a long walk, they each had to tell a story. And the idea was that they'd all tell a story on the way there and they'd tell another one on the way back. And the best story would win a prize. Well, it's only ever been half finished because he only got to tell the stories they told going in one direction before he died. Geoffrey Chaucer, that is. So of the pilgrims, only one woman is secular. In other words, the other women that feature, and I think there's only two or three more, uh, are religious women, nuns and a prioress. And the one that's probably the most famous and the most talked about in those days when, when it first appeared and certainly throughout history since has been the wife of Bath. And the wife of Bath not only tells a tale, she has a prologue. Some of the characters, the pilgrims do have a prologue where they tell their own story. And I always loved her story. It's really quite naughty. It's really bawdy and, and, and lusty and she's loud and boastful and vain. And she tells all the pilgrims there that she knows everything there is to know about marriage. She knows everything about sex and ask her anything. She's really good at it and she's a great businesswoman. And she tells them how she has had five successful marriages and her first being at the age of 12 to a much older man. And then her next, well, her first three husbands were much older. Then she married for love but wasn't happy. And then she married a man 20 years her junior who she met, well, I think she knew him beforehand, but 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 sort of, um, uh, how do you put it, uh, solidified the relationship at her husband's funeral and they were married a month later and his name was Jankin and he's the only one named in the poem. And then we, when we meet her, of course, she's on a pilgrimage and presumably her, her fifth husband's died and she's on the hunt for a sixth one. So she caused all sorts of ructions because she was clever and learned and she kept saying to the men, you on the pilgrimage, you all write about, you know, these wicked women, these hateful, horrible women, and 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 that's not fair, and we're not like that, and or or you know, just imagine if women wrote history, how different it would be. So that always absolutely fascinated me. I thought, here's Geoffrey Chaucer putting words in this woman's mouth and presenting her as really vain, arrogant, and boastful. Is he an early feminist, like a lot of scholars say, and sort of overturning a lot of the negative stereotypes about women? Or is he just confirming every negative stereotype by having this, this mouthy, vain, loud woman? So I thought, what if she could tell her own story? So using those bare bones, if you like, the five marriages, married off very young and um, on the hunt for, maybe for a sixth husband and all these pilgrimages all around the world, I tried to put creative flesh on them. And so my good wife was born. What was it really like to be married in those days? And what were the men really like? What was the sex like? I mean, I was curious. I hope you are too. And, you know, it was in the era when uh, medieval tourism was uh, just coming, coming to the fore. So everybody, whether they were rich or poor, could travel and they could um, experience other cultures. And uh, so it, it was fabulous doing that as well and sort of having a look at, um, I guess, these other cultures through this lusty woman's eyes so yeah that that was my inspiration if you like for the good wife of bath now i do have to go back and say some hellos i'm so sorry i'm missing people um oh jane tara hi hi thank you um and bev oh cold adelaide it's cold here in hobart too kylie as well yep and oh but she's she's an essential worker oh you take care um oh thank you karen she loved the locksmith's daughter thank you very much i loved writing it and um, Meredith, oh, I'm glad you can't wait to read my books. And, oh, where do I like to be when I write? Right here. You are all in my study with me. And what you can't see is I'm surrounding my books. I have a little dog 
I actually have three dogs actually over there. Yeah, um, in the basket over there. So I always have my dogs with me. And yes, Jesse, I love historical fiction too. And Sancho, I hope I'm saying your name correctly. You lived in Bath and read Chaucer and the wife of Bath. Yep, I've, I've been to Bath. It's a beautiful place. Oh, Jesse's asked me which period of history inspires me the most. You know, if I was smart, I would just stick to one period and get really, really good at it. But the problem is I get fascinated by all the, the periods. So I've written books from the 1300s, 1400s, 1500s, 1600s and 1700s. I just finished The Wife of Bath, set in the 1300s. I'm now writing and I'm back in the late 1600s. And then the book after that jumps to the late 1700s and back to Scotland. So uh, I like them all, Jesse, quite simply. I love history, fascinated by it. Sharon says, this book sounds really good. How long did this take you to write and how much research did you have to do? Oh, great questions. Um, well, they probably, on average, the books take me a, a good year of solid writing plus a good year of solid research. And when I'm editing one book, I've already started the other, as in the research, and usually had a bit of a dip at writing the first few chapters, which just get rewritten so much it's crazy. Um, so I'd say on average two to three years per book, but as I say, they, they overlap. And what's really scary sometimes is when I'm asked questions, say, about this book, I find it really hard to remember the answers or, or what went on because I'm so far into my next book. But anyway, oh, Melissa, this is so fascinating. Oh, thank you. And um, Sancia, five? What, what was the five? Oh, dear, see? And I haven't even drunk any wine. I have no excuse. I don't know what you mean. Um, sorry. Um, oh, and Jill, I answered how long it took to write the book. And then um, Janine. Oh, you love The Good Wife of Bath. Thank you. It's a sensational read. I had to read that out. Thank you. And which authors inspire me? Oh, that's a great question. I think every author, and in fact, I was talking to my husband just before I came on air and I was saying, if I had to name my favourite book, I would have so much trouble. Um, I read widely. I read crime. I read romance. I read nonfiction or lots of nonfiction because I do all the research. Um, I love sci-fi fantasy. I love good science fiction. Lately, I've been reading so many brilliant Australian authors. Um, I just not long ago finished Last of the Apple Blossom by Mary Lou Stevens, which is coming out very, very soon. Wonderful, wonderful historical fiction. I'm reading Tanya, Fallery, uh, Tanya Farrelly's The Eighth Wonder, which is just exquisite and loving every, every page, every word. Um, the End of Men, what a fantastic read. So I, I could go on. I get lots of inspiration from you all at Better Reading and the Happy Valley um, Books Read guys. They're fabulous too. Um, oh, and Phil loved the book. Thank you. Oh, and Phil said, I should have said that the comical element was a standout. What I'm loving about when people read The Wife of Bath is how funny they're finding it. Um, Geoffrey Chaucer was not only raunchy and bawdy and naughty, you know, it's full of farting and sex and naming ladies bits and all sorts of things. Um, it, uh, it's very, very funny. So I'm glad I was able to sort of capture that that mood too. And oh, hi, Margaret. Hi, hi, from and Margaret from Sydney. Um, and Becky, ah, I also have an idea for historical fiction set in the third in hundreds. However, how much research do you think is needed to really know and evoke an era? Cool. Did you ever worry that historians would have issues with anything? Ah, oh, ah, oh, do I have a story to tell? Or do you think the author has creative license to create their own version of the past? Aha, uh -huh. it's my pleasure for today. Thank you. Okay, they are great questions. I think you know when you've done enough research. Um, I'm a pedant, I admit that, and it's probably my academic background. So, for example, if I name a fabric that, that is worn in a, used in a garment, I have to go and check that that actually was around there. I'll give you an example with The Good Wife of Bath. She's often described, everyone depicts her in paintings and pictures as wearing red because in the poem it says scarlet, she wears scarlet. But scarlet was actually the name of the fabric. I didn't know that. And um, But I also have her in red, red scarlet, which sounds um, like an oxymoron almost. Or, no, no, that's not the word I mean. You know what I mean, the, like you're saying the same thing twice. Is that an oxymoron? Anyway, um, but it's, uh, yeah, so... I, the food they eat, everything. And certainly when I introduce a real historical figure, which I have in all my books, Chaucer is actually a lead character in, in The Good Wife of Bath, um, I, I have to be true to that. So, but beyond that, I have complete creative license, license with the invented characters, but I tr try to weave real history into my stories too, um, which I guess gives me, if you like, a spine. And then I build, you know, all the, the, the body work around that. But, um, 
I have to stop myself researching because I'll research everything and I'll never write the damn book. So <laughs> it's, um, it's a bit hard. But, yes, you will get your pedant historians emailing you with corrections and I'll tell you a doozy in the locksmith's daughter, and it was a typo, I swear, there's a place in England called Baynard's Castle, or there was in medieval times. I, I'm i blaming the computer. I'm doing a Scott Morrison. I'm not owning my mistakes. Um, I, um, I kept calling it Barnyard's Castle and it appeared in print as Barnyard's Castle. So, of course, this historian put me, and quite rightly, in my place, and I, I thanked him graciously for his unkind comments because he didn't do it kindly <laughs> and it was corrected in the next version. So, yes, but I also get grammar Nazis piling on and it's hard because you don't often see your own mistakes and even your editors who are the best but read the book over and over don't see your mistakes. So there you go. Ah, Jill, have you got any favourite authors to read? I think I just named a whole heap but I have to name Sarah Douglas as one of my all-time favourites too. I still go back to her, word, uh, her books. They're like comfort food for me. Her and Anne McCaffrey, actually. I really love Anne McCaffrey. Jenny says, or Jenny Coyle. Hi, Jenny. And, oh, Cara, my daughter's there. Hi, Cara. Um, Jenny Coyle says, sounds like my kind of story. Oh, from the deep south of New Zealand in Southland, one of my favourite places to be. I love New Zealand. And sometimes the show is there right now. <laughs> um, Jackie Jensen. Oh, thank you, Jackie. Loving the book so far. Oh, you're up to husband number four. Yes, the book is divided into the five husbands and the pilgrimages, and then what happens beyond that. And I should tell you, for those of you who don't know, Alison's story, the good wife story, continues in this book, which I wrote way before. I wrote this back in 2012, 2013. It was published in 2014 and about the medieval brewer. Halfway through this book, Alison comes into the story as a lead character, and it will take you from where you leave her off in the good wife of Bath to what happens but, of course, the main character is this lady, whoop, whoop, Annika Sheldrake. So if you still want to know what happens to Alison, the Brewer's Tales, the book for you. But, yeah, I loved her so much in that. And she was based on The Good Wife of Bath. I thought, what would happen to The Good Wife of Bath beyond the poem, you know, as an older woman in her 50s? And so she appears in The Brewer's Tale. And I always knew because I loved her so much that I had to go back and write her full story. And um, hello, Julia. You're about to start with my books. Thank you. Alona, oh, the cover. The cover is divine, isn't it? it it's just gorgeous. I wish you could, um, we had uh, better vision, but you can see they're all foiled, the trees, but the little figurines stand out. They're all embossed. It's just, I keep stroking it. It's lovely. Hello, Valerie, you're going to start reading. Oh, you enjoyed The Chocolate Maker's Wife. I, I have a real soft spot for that. I ate and drank far too much chocolate, but it was good fun. And hello, Jacqueline. Oh, you love that I write so many different periods. I'm, I'm really grateful. Thank you. I love history too. Oh, yes, five husbands. That's what you meant. Yes. Well, Sancha, I'll tell you a little story. My mother and Jenny, my sister's listening to this, our mother had eight husbands, truly. There's a story about it in, in the newspaper a couple of weeks ago. Ah, uh, and there's my darling friend Catherine, Cat, 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 a fabulous author herself, Catherine Howe, the crime writer, fantastic crime writer, Thank you, darling. I wish I could see your face too. Uh, Jill, yes, I do have another book in the pipeline. I'm currently writing a book called The Escapades of Tribulation Johnson, and it's set in roughly the 16, 1678 it starts but quickly moves into the 1680s in England, and it's set around Restoration Theatre and stars Tribulation Johnson but also Afra Ben, the first female playwright and indeed the first English novelist. But that's a bone of contention, but she was. Uh, Xenia, hello, thank you. Oh, hello and goodbye. And Cara said, do you think, this is my daughter, do you ever think you would ever write a book set in the present day or future? Not the future. I think I will write one in the present day. I'd really like to, yeah. And thank you, Mary Lou. <laughs> ah, Kerry, yes, yes, yes. Um, she's got down some one of her favourite books is... Um, the 10,000 Doors of January. Uh, Kerry and I um, share our love of books and often tell each other or hint to each other what we should be reading. We both adore The 10,000 Doors of January. Oh, and Jenny, thank you. <laughs> My sister's telling me she loves me. I love her too. Um, oh, tautology. Thank you, Mary Lou. That's the word. That's when you say the same thing twice. And I'm the academic. Great. Um, thank you, Miriam, too. <laughs> See, it's good. You people keep me on my toes. Thank you. Keep me right. Julie um, Foster, good evening, Karen. There are so many good writers coming out of Tasmania at the moment. Is there an active writing community there or how have you built your community if you have one? 
Julie, I agree with you. I am stunned by what's coming, not just out of Tassie, indeed Australia. Again, I was saying that earlier to my husband too. I just think we're leaving the world a little bit in the dust with the quality of our writing, not that I'm biased or anything. I think Australian writers are superb. And I know that Happy Valley Books Read guys will agree with me. They are such great um, supporters of Australian writers, just incredible. Um, I am very much a loner, I have to admit. I'm a bit of a recluse, and that's partly because I have ongoing issues because of the cancer, so I don't get out as much as I'd like to and ask forgiveness for that. Um, but the writing community, people are just supportive. Our bookshops here are so supportive. The readers are so supportive. There is a really vibrant, um, active community and, and love of reading here. And I, I don't know, the landscape, the climate just lends itself to it. It's wonderful. Oh, Sue. Hi, Sue from Bendigo. Well, are you in Bendigo now? Um, thank you. So enjoying this chat. And, oh, Mary Lou, why are there so many sticky notes in the Brewers Tale? Trust you, you ex-journal, you journalist with your, an author, you're noticing. This is because I never reread my books. I just don't. Um, once they're done and dusted, they're done and dusted. But because I had to merge Alison's story from The Good Wife of Bath, I'm trying to point correctly to it on the screen there, there we go, I did it, um, with what happens in the Brewer's Tale, I had to read this book. So that's where I had to make sure the parts of her life or characters that appear merged with what I wrote in the latter part of The Good Wife of Bart. There you go, that's why. Ah, <laughs> um, oh, Happy Valley Books Read. Which one of the husbands was a favourite to write about? I really like the challenge of the first husband because you imagine a 12-year-old marrying a 61-year-old. That was really, really hard. But my favourite husband was Mervyn Slinge, husband number three. He was the oldest, and I'm not going to do spoilers for people who haven't read it, but I think he was one of the most interesting and kindest of her husbands. I loved him. Ah, uh, Linda. Hi, Linda. Love the Brewer's Tale. Thank you. Ah, uh, Sue, any hankering to write fantasy again? I always hanker to write fantasy. Um, and, yeah, I, I actually have a, a synopsis for a trilogy in a drawer. I don't, I don't know. I don't know whether that's been left behind me or not, but never say never. Um, and, Tracy, I adore that title. Thank you. Joy Bell, hello. Looking forward to this book. I hope you really enjoy it. And um, hi, Carrie. Oh, I wonder if that's um, Shannon. And... Happy Valley Books, I agree. Australian writers, the best writers in the world. Australia-wide for women writers are amazing. Yes, the guys too, of course. Yes, Joy Bell, they are. And one of my favourites, if you're asking who my favourites are that I read recently, Michael Robotham. Oh, my goodness. I know. Just carve out, forget sleep, forget doing anything. Once I pick up a Michael Robotham, that's it. I'm gone. And his latest was absolutely brilliant. Ah, Karen Donnellan, I know you. Yes, a former student of mine at Sunshine Coast University, 1998 to 2002. Oh, you were my favourite lecturer. I didn't pay her. Honestly, I didn't. Thank you, Karen. Do you think your time at uni helped you with your writing? Oh, absolutely, Karen. It really, really did. And I do remember you. It's lovely to, to see you there. Um, absolutely, it did. And, you know, I always learned from my students and probably more than I ever taught you. And, um, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it totally helped me. It taught me not to be precious about being edited. It taught me to uh, not be afraid to take criticism and to always think of um, my readers too. So thank you. Tracy Anderson said, I think Australian authors do such quality research with historical fiction. I agree. And I think particularly, um, you know, when we set them in Australia and like Darry Fraser and um, Victoria Perman, fantastic writers who do brilliant research, brilliant narratives, Tia Cooper too, just wonderful. I know the work they put in and they do a great job. But I think also for us that look overseas, like I'm reading Tanya Farrelly at the moment, you would never know that she wasn't a Native American, that her, her knowledge of the history of early, well, New York in the, uh, I think it's the early 1900s is just outstanding. And I'm very aware that I'm not English or Scottish. I have Scottish roots. Um, but um, so I, I, maybe that's why I do so much research too, just to make sure that I can immerse myself as much as possible. I've also done trips there too, but that's not the same. Oh, Kerry's asked me, what was the biggest challenge in writing her sexuality? She, what she means by that is, yeah, um, Alison in The Good Wife of Bath is a very uh, sensual, sexual woman. And in those days, of course, you just, women were, you know, uh, like, like uh, seen and not heard, you know, shut up, submissive, quiet, weren't allowed to express their desires. They were considered unnatural. 
it was huge. And yet, because I felt I knew her so well, and Chaucer again had given me these wonderful, uh, a wonderful basis for forming her character. Admittedly, she's probably in her 40s by the time we meet her in the Canterbury Tales. So I had to sort of develop her, think about what a childhood would have been like, how she would have thought about sex and treated it and what her sexual experiences would have been to make how she became authentic. So, yeah, it was a real challenge, but one I really, really enjoyed. Great question. Um, ah, will more of your books become audiobooks? I rely on them a lot. Yeah, Karen, so many people do. The Darker Shore is being done right now as an audiobook and a wonderful, wonderful actress is doing the most amazing job. Um, the... The Good Wife of Bath is going into audio, and I know that um, it's been published in America and England and Canada in January, and they're doing an audio book as well, different to the Australian one, which is fantastic. Um, oh, can I tell us anything about what I'm writing now? I did say quickly before, but I'll just say again, it's um, The Escapades of Tribulation Johnson, set in the later 1600s around the theatre um, and, and, and journalism and, um, and the popish plot. Um, to overthrow the king and put Catholics back on the throne. It was quite horrible what was happening there. And it was where fake news went through the roof. In fact, the term false news was very prominent then. So I'm loving that. And Afra Ben, a real character from history, is one of the lead characters. Ah, Becky Rogerson. Hi, Becky, has asked, can you tell us about your daily writing routine and what works best for you? Okay, I haven't got much longer, so I'll be fast. I, I treat writing very much as a business and um, I might faff around some days, but generally I don't. I work definitely five days, sometimes six days a week. I dress for work. I come to my study and I work probably a good solid five, six hours. I eat standing up because I'm on my bum all day, but but I, I go for a run first thing in the morning to get the little brains off, the little grey cells, as Poirot would say, uh, working. And... Um, yeah, and then I basically save whatever I've done. I start the next day by editing what I did the day before and then try and move forward every day. I try to get anywhere between three and 5,000 words done a day. Sometimes I'm lucky if I get 600. Other days, I did have one day where I wrote 8,000. That was nuts and, and it was all shit. No, <laughs> it wasn't great. I had to go back and get rid of a lot of it. Um, of course, I remember Karen. Sorry, sorry. I'm loving reading this. Great reads and tea leaves. Hi, great reads and tea leaves. Did you rely on travel for any of your research? And are you able to complete that online? Both. Um, when I wrote, yes, I, I did travel when we could. And um, that was fabulous. But what that was often doing was consolidating online work and reading that I'd done. I do, I do a bit of online work. I mainly read books. And because when I was in the army, all those years ago, I was a cartographer. I have a great love of maps. And I have a very good old map collection. So I pore over maps and I try to really locate myself spatially in the period. So I will walk the streets and stuff like that um, in black and white in two dimensions. Okay, Jenny Coyle, hi. I'm a Kiwi and I think every second book I've read in the past two years is by an Aussie, most likely because I love listening to better reading. Oh, that's great. We love better reading. So I keep adding book titles to my to-read list, yes. And, of course, many of those are Aussie authors. Fantastic range of styles and I think I can relate I think I can relate as we're neighbours and so much about Oz is familiar to me. Yes, I think that's absolutely true and I actually really enjoy quite a few New Zealand authors too, so, yeah. Um, all right, Cara's asked me, who is your favourite character in the book or favourite to write? And I should have just asked you on the phone today. Sorry, Mum. <laughs> you should have. Um, always the wife, the wife, but I I, um, I love the third husband and... Um, I love some of the characters later in the book. I don't want to again say too much. Um, hi, KC. How much say as an author do you get in who narrates your characters in audio? Oh, that's a great question too. You're given um, a list, uh, you're given a few voices to choose from. And, in fact, what I found was the Americans give you about six or seven. Um, we, we only get two or three, and they can be English or, uh, for my books, or Australian who can do great English or Scottish in this instance accents. Um, oh, Janine, can you imagine The Good Wife of Bath being made into a film? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can imagine all my books being made into a film or a TV show. If so, who would you like to play the role of the wife? Oh, there is an actress, and damn it if I, I can't remember her name, and she's a British actress. Oh, God, and it's just got The Nevers. She was in The Nevers. Um, she was the, one of the older characters with red hair, and she, she just looked like the wife to me. If any of you have seen The Nevers, it's really interesting, really good. Um, 
Okay, Mary Lewis said, Chaucer is a character in The Good Wife of Bath and you've used real people as characters in your other books. What do you need to keep in mind when including real people in your fiction? Um, you can't really invent too much for them. I mean, of course you can invent dialogue and emotional um, authenticity and stuff like that. What, what I loved with um, some of the characters, the real characters I put in, was that you got... Um, I found, like, when I read biographies of Sir Francis Walsingham in The Locksmith's Daughter, for example, there was The Missing Years. With Chaucer, there was The Missing Years. So that that's just like a gift to an author. So I could fill in what I wanted there. But otherwise, I, I drew a timeline of all the major events in their life and I stuck to it. And where they were relevant, they went into the book. Where they didn't um, drive the narrative forward, I excluded them. I just didn't worry. Um Kerry, it is such a joyous book, which is a really fresh, amazing way to write women back into history. Mwah. Thank you, Kerry. <laughs> Sue, did you always have a desire to write books and when did you realise you had a talent and don't be modest? I'm always learning. I, uh, thank you. That's a really, really kind thing to say. Um, I didn't always have a desire to write books. I know lots of authors say, oh, no, I wrote books when I was three and five and I'm a bit in awe of those people. I think I wrote all the time. But it was absolute rubbish. Um I wrote as an academic and I think, um, and I love doing that. And I think because I was exercising that part of my brain and you had to use a certain language and you spent a year writing a piece of 5,000 words and two people read it if you were lucky, I think that I just felt that I needed to um, delve into my imagination and use words in a different way and hopefully get a bigger audience than two. So, um, but thank you. That's a really kind thing to say. Thank you. And yes, Kylie, I love Australian authors too. So I think that's about it from me and I've, I've gone over and thank you so much for spending time with me. I had my glass of wine and I didn't drink any of it. So I'm going to now. Cheers to you and thank you again, guys. It's been really lovely having you. Thank you.